Jen Dobre. Jen Dobre. Come on, Warsaw. Wroclaw. You know what I'm talking about? Ole Schnitza, Nisa. Nove Sanj, where my grandmother was born in Poland. That's how they say good morning, Jen Dobre. I hope you've all eaten Polish food. Have you? How many of you had kielbasa? Come on, you haven't lived till you had kielbasa. Kielbasa, naleśniki, pierogies, have you ever had that? You know, I grew up on like peasant food. My parents didn't have much money and Polish food is not exotic, highly spiced and all of that and cream sauces and all that like the French have, but it, ooh, it's good. But my favorite is, it's called different names in different countries around there, but potato pancakes. Oh, that's onions, but thin. I've told you that, but let me tell you again. That was the thing I loved the most. My mother made the best potato pancakes, like this big, oh, potato, some celery, a little onions, not, maybe not celery. I think it was chopped up celery. No, maybe onions, just. And my mother would be working and going through all the stuff with my dad, drinking. And I would say, Mom, could, I was like 10, 11, 12. Mom, could I have potato pancakes? She'd say, listen, you peel the potatoes, you grind them, uh, uh, grate them, and you can have it. So I'd peel the potatoes. I didn't like to do that, but for potato pancakes, I would climb Mount Everest. So I'd peel them, and then I'd take the potato and after being in water, and I'd grate them, and just had this grater, and you'd have to rub it. But when it got close, I'm rubbing it, and and the it's going in to like a bigger bowl. The potato kind of grated up, and almost pureed, and and uh, and I'm doing it. And if you're not careful, you get too close to the the grater, and I scrape my knuckles. My mother would be, I would be here, my mother would be behind me at the stove doing something else, and I'd scrape it, and a little drop of blood would go in to the potato. And before she could ever notice it, i just mix and stir it in. Hey, a little blood with your potato pancakes, come on. There's nothing better. After six days, uh, Mark 9, 2, Jesus took Peter, James, and John and led them up to a high mountain, by themselves to be alone. He was transfigured, but that's a good thought. He led them to a way to be alone with him. Hmm. He was transfigured in front of them, and his clothes became dazzling, extremely white, as no launderer on earth could whiten them. So he's becoming like glorified in front of them. His garments become dazzling white, He's transfigured. It's Jesus, but it's Jesus in another mode, another appearance almost, although it was Jesus. And appearing with him, Elijah appeared to them with Moses, and they were talking with Jesus. And Luke adds, they were talking to him about his exodus. The cross, his departure. Now this was a this was the kingdom of God come to them. They saw things no one before or after saw. Jesus transfigured in front of them. Then Elijah, the mightiest prophet, in many ways, and Moses, the lawgiver. So we had the prophets, him summing that up, and Moses, the lawgiver. Jesus is the final word God has to say in terms of prophecy. And Moses stood for the law. Jesus is our law, our law fulfilled. And now we are under, not the law of Moses, we're under the law of Christ. And they appeared to him. And guess what they were talking about? The thing we all should be talking about. Already with God, as they appeared, they knew that he was heading toward the cross. But the word that 
that's used for his departure is the word like exodus, his departure to another place, not just his death and the pain, but his release from earth, doing God's will at such a high price. And they talked about that and probably encouraged him. I, I mean, I can't imagine it. I can't imagine it. But Peter said to them, said to Jesus, Rabbi, it's good for us to be here. Let's set up three shelters, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah, because he did not know what to say since they were terrified. And Peter probably filled Mark in about that moment. And Mark wrote it. Let's make three tabernacles and just stay here forever. Let's not go back into the world and have to minister to people with their problems. No, there are people like that. But let's go, before we get to that, let's look at this. Let's build three tabernacles. He linked Elijah and Moses on the same ground as it were with Jesus. Isn't that like a lot today? Preachers and Bible teachers, many times, shame, shame, to their own blame, trying to get attention and reverential treatment. They're on the same level with Jesus. No, many people talk more about their pastor or some Bible teacher or some prophet who knows everything about what's happening in the Middle East than they do about our Lord Jesus Christ. Shame, shame. Oh, I grew up around that. Pastor, the pastor said, you know, on Sunday, pastor said, pastor's just a sinner saved by grace. How would you ever bring him on the same footing as our Lord and Savior? Superstars, superstar evangelists, TV televangelists, and almost Jesus gets lost in his own house. Mm -hmm. Gets lost in his own house. Let's not do that today. Has someone been a blessing to you, a pastor, a, a writer, and all of that? Oh, let's thank God for them. Thank God for them. Thank God for them. But please, if you got close and knew any of them intimately, you'd see, oh, wow. But the closer you get to Jesus, oh, praise God, Jesus. And they shall call his name Jesus because he and he alone will save his people from their sins. Let's elevate Jesus, not put other people down, appreciate them, but never worship them or be so attracted to them that they end up being one of the stars in the sky. No, no, no stars. Just one son, the Lord Jesus Christ. Till next time, bye-bye. Mm -hmm.